words. Uh, I hope uh, you can appreciate that uh, I have a challenge. And that challenge is uh, there's value, potentially, in uh, having some entertainment, having some fun. And yet, uh, this is an incredibly somber situation uh, that, that we have to discuss. Um, so I hope you can appreciate that if there is some humor that may come out of it, it is not intended at all to be disrespectful. Um, it's um, just part of being human, I guess. But with that, who in here is a, a pilot? Any pilots in the room? None. Okay. Unless, I mean, this light's hard, so I don't see any. So that's going to be interesting. We'll see how we go with this. So I'm Ken Seip. Uh, I'm an application engineer. Been working in distributed systems for a long time. Uh, there's how to get a hold of me on Twitter and email. Um, work in a variety of different languages have for years. But the other thing that is lesser known, potentially, is that I'm also an instrument rated private pilot, and I have been since 98. I have uh, flown, as you see here, and they become important during the talk, the, a Cessna 152, a 172, a 182, um, a Piper Cherokee Arrow, uh, and an Archer. I actually partly own an Arrow, and I fly it quite commonly. Um, and uh, I've got 800 hours plus, which is really foreign. That's really strange. I mean, unless you're going to go after your instrument, uh, I'm sorry, unless you're going to go after uh, commercial airlines, uh, it's unlikely that uh, a private pilot would have that many hours. But I've been very fortunate. Uh, last November, we had an engineering week. Uh, it was in Vegas in the United States. Uh, it just happened I, I decided to fly myself. <laughs> and it has some, there's some great, great things that uh, come out of being able to be a pilot. On the left here, you'll see um, uh, I flew over Niagara Falls. And on the right, you'll see my stepson, who's eight, who decided he was going to fly that day. <laughs> so, so anybody can do it, clearly, right? <laughs> but unfortunately, what we're going to talk about is some, some, some ch terrible things, um, ch challenges. And uh, you know, wh where it comes into play in our conversation here today is uh, software did this. Software. Uh, this is a software conference. It seems important that we recognize uh, some of the contributing factors as well. When we have an accident involving aviation, in particular the United States, or when it involves United States created aircraft, there's a thing called the NTSB, which is the National Transportation and Safety Board, which will always report on this thing. What you'll see on that site, which you all have access to as well, um, uh, you, you basically see that uh, they haven't been invited to actually participate in some of the review at this point. Uh, so you'll see a couple of failures that have happened. What is fortunate is that we have had a full report in Indonesia's Lion Air, which I'm going to go through right now. Um, we're going to go fairly rapidly through this, and I'm going to educate you. Uh, I noticed there were no pilots in the room, but uh, you're about to start your journey. You're about to start learning what you would need to know in order to be a pilot. The other thing that I'll add is my understanding is uh, uh, the pilot license is internationally recognized. So that's, uh, that's a good thing. I should be able to fly here um, someday, someday. <laughs> so here is the report. There's a full PDF. We cannot go through it in its totality. It's more than 200 pages. It's, uh, it's pretty significant. But here are a few things that I have summarized through rapid slides. On October 28th, 2018, there's a Boeing 737-8 MAX. Some important things to note, it was Lion Air Flight 610, but its call sign was Lima November India 650. Uh, its intended uh, flight level was flight level 270. At 2315 Zulu, pilots all have the same time that we always work with, it is UTC and we call it Zulu time. At that time, there was a taxi checklist and they contacted Tower. And roughly the same time, they were asked to line up on 2-5 two, uh, two left. They performed their checklist. They, they were cleared for departure. And at 23-20-01 Zulu, they punched it. Here's where it becomes interesting, almost immediately. Within 15 seconds, the, um, <clears throat> the pilot flying, which is PF, reports uh, an airspeed of 79 knots. The first officer reports airspeed at 81, which is some differences, but that's not the most significant difference. The attitude indicator was off by 21 degrees. And what you don't know at this point, what they did not know at this point, 
is that there was a, a failure reported on this plane some time before this that they had replaced the attitude indicator uh, on one side of the plane and they had installed it exactly 21 degrees out of sync of where it should have been. It becomes very significant <clears throat> through this story. 16 seconds later, V1 is hit, which is a rotation speed for this aircraft. One second later, the flight officer says, rotate. Two seconds later, we have a nose gear up. We're off the ground. Within four seconds, we're climbing 1,000 feet per minute, and the captain is querying, uh, asking questions about aircraft problems. Within seconds, within 15 seconds, we know that we have an issue. This should be lesson one. When we have a failure that occurs, it's, a, it's super and critically important to resolve that issue as quickly as possible. In flying, we call it flying ahead of the plane. You always are ahead of the plane. If you're not, you, it, bad things happen. Three seconds later, they're airborne. They are cleared for departure on ABASA 1 Charlie. That's their flight out of the airport that they're leaving. It's a standard departure. Four seconds later, the, fly, uh, the, the flying officer uh, request the captain uh, or indicated the captain that there was uh, an indication of airspeed disagreement. It's important information. They're off, left and right. We have redundant systems in place. Now, there's more than just this redundant system, but in this case, we're just talking about airspeed on two different displays. And what you can see here is there was a qu request to uh, basically enter the pattern again, to land, which was denied. Uh, denied by the captain of the aircraft. Seven seconds later, we have gear up. 11 seconds later, they were asked to switch to control on terminal in, uh, east, which is just a switching of a frequency. What I want you to realize and, and, and kind of get the sense of is you're a fly in the cockpit right now. Notice all the things that are rapid fire within seconds happening. They are switching frequencies. They had to already have dialed this in and they hit a button to switch over because they were prepared for this. They got this information on the ground. But that's gonna change here shortly. The flying officer says we have an altitude disagreement. We have different displays on the primary flight device of 340 versus 570. Within 10 more seconds, they have finally contacted radar, uh, I'm sorry, the, when you report to the controller and you switch frequencies, they will say radar contact. They have been radar contact, it's a confirmation. Uh, they are instructed to fly at flight level 270, which is 27,000 feet. Six, six seconds later, the, flying, uh, the, the flight officer uh, asked control to confirm their altitude. They have disagreement, they don't understand, they are debugging in the air. They're debugging their situation in the air. This is almost crazy, right? Nine seconds later, this is interesting. The captain says, memory items for airspeed unreliable. No response from the flying officer. Seven seconds later, there is a request to the captain to land, basically. He then says no, ask control for a, a holding pattern. We're gonna hold and figure this out. Now, there's, when you are flying in and out of an airport, one of the challenges you have is you have inbound aircraft, you got outbound aircraft, you don't, oftentimes you're cognizant of the fact that there's already a cleared plane and you're not trying to interrupt that. There's some courtesies that are trying to be put into play. But one of the lessons here is when you have a problem, you have to declare that you do have a problem. If they would have said, pan, pan, or mayday, mayday, or emergency, none of the instructions we were about to see would have even happened. They would have cleared the entire airspace for them. They would have told all other aircraft to avoid. But instead, the captain makes a decision, put us in a hold. We're being put in a hold, that's what he's requesting, with an aircraft for which has unreliable airspeed, has unreliable altitude indication, they are having struggles in trying to understand it, and he wants to continue flying and see what happens. One second later, they, uh, they're, 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 they turn left. This becomes important in a second. Seven, seven seconds later, they request the hold problem with aircraft. Control's like, what problem? What are you talking about? Flight control problem. No hold or instructions follow. No, there's no, uh, now again, uh, they called emergency, they would have had immediate attention. They start to add flaps, this becomes important, we'll see the, uh, later on in the presentation why this is valuable, but they add flaps, which means that the software is not gonna kick in, that caused some challenges. Four seconds later, uh, 
the flight officer takes control and the flight officer responds standby. So we're seeing all communications that are happening. The report goes in significantly more detail than this. 11 seconds later, the control sees that the aircraft is de descending from 1,700 to, uh, to 1,600, essentially. And they're like, he calls up, what's going on and what's your intended altitude? There's a request for 6,000, the captain responds 5,000, they get some agreements on 5,000, that's where they're gonna go. Uh, what's also important here is control says climb to 5,000, uh, actually what they would say, climb and maintain 5,000, turn heading 050. So they're supposed to be heading to 050, there's an acknowledgement of this command. They have onboard flight systems that indicate bank angle, bank angle. Well, this would happen if you violated what we would call standard rate turns in, in, in aviation. We have standard rate turns within controlled airspace so we know when an aircraft is, is turning that it takes exactly one minute to turn 180 degrees and it takes exactly two minutes to do 360. It's exactly, we know exactly Test, test, okay, great, thank you. <laughs> you guys are right. Anytime we are turning, usually if you're turning greater than a 30 degree bank, you're gonna get like, uh, that, that, that's more of a steep turn. Uh, between 30 degrees and 45 degrees, uh, uh, and frankly, anything over 60 degrees is considered an acrobatic move. So uh, at this point, they are getting reports and noise, but notice what's going on. They're trying to figure out their uh, altitude, altitude issues. They're trying to figure out their flight speeds. They're trying to figure out and diagnose all this stuff. They're trying to head to a certain turn. They're trying to respond to, to requests on, on the radio. They are trying to maintain visual reference to other aircraft that are in the vicinity, uh, all while trying to bank to a certain uh, direction. And they're violating, and now they're getting the airplane to scream at them. The plane is saying bank left, or uh, bank angle, bank angle. One second later, uh, they retract flaps, also important. You're gonna see a lot in the next set of slides, AD, uh, A-N-D, when you see it, it's aircraft nose down. The system is trying to force the airplane nose down, which is the opposite of ADU, which is at, uh, the attitude of going up. So eight seconds later, the captain instructs the flight uh, officer to set flaps to one, and it results in an a, uh, the, a nose going up, which is exactly what we want at, at this particular point in time. Three seconds later, the flight officer calls 5,000, they finally reached altitude. One second later, we descend at a loss of 600 feet instantly. Yeah, when they say buckle up, they kind of mean it, right? That's, that, that, that actually can happen, but in this case, it may have been induced by the system itself. Four seconds. Uh, what's important here is there's a record, on record, within the flight uh, uh, report that uh, we still see 21 degrees uh, out of sync, uh, the attitude indicator. Also super important. Six seconds later, we're trying to push the nose down. Nose down, it's driving the, the airplane itself. It seems like it's possessed. Who's in control? That becomes an interesting question later on. All right, now I'm gonna go through some other things real quick, right? Uh, we're, we're talking to control. Uh, we all of a sudden, we get low speed, the, the, the airplane is yelling at us again, airspeed, airspeed. Uh, we have disagreements on airspeed. We start to get uh, the shake on the control. Airspeed problems, starts to shake. Now we're getting lots of feedback. We're getting the thing screaming at us. We're getting the shake going on. There's lots of things going on in this plane and we're only seconds into the flight. Actually, total time is three minutes up to this point. We go flaps up and the captain is yelling memory item, memory item. Now I can tell you, I have no idea what that means and you'll find out later who he was talking to doesn't know what that means either. So where this comes from is uh, it's unclear to me. It's totally unclear. We try to go nose down again. You can see that for four, 
uh, four seconds later, there's a one second decline. Every time you see that, the captain is like reversing it. He's on the trim. There's actually a wheel that's on your, if you're sitting left seat, there's a wheel on your right. Use it all the time for trimming up and down. And he's adjusting that to correct what the plane is trying to do. The flight officer is advising uh, s some issues, uh, trying to work through some details. Uh, you can see that we have nose down. We have a heading of 100. Zero, zero. Where are they supposed to be heading? 050. Zero, zero. So they're, they're pretty significantly off. Uh, the flight officer, flight control, captain, yeah. <laughs> Some communication going on in the cabin. Captain asked for the checklist for unreliable airspeed. This becomes a significant problem. When you get, uh, when you're a pilot, especially a commercial pilot, there are certain checklists you should have absolutely memorized and certainly you should have easy access to the full checklist and you should be able to find what you're looking for. We have a second in command in the airplane who is lost, doesn't know what the checklist is, can't find it, papers are flipping and they're trying to maintain the aircraft speed and altitude all at the same time. We have a positive rate of climb at this particular time. Flight officer advises, un unable to locate the, the checklist. The, uh, the, prime, the captain basically tells him it's on 10.0, or 10.1, sorry, it's up there on the screen. 10.1, here's where it is. <laughs> so he's gonna have to babysit this guy, right? 10 seconds later, now we start to run into real trouble. The MCAS, the MCAS, that is the software. It's trimming, the thing to note. It tries to trim hard down 10 seconds every five seconds. Until you fix the problem, it's gonna try to push down hard for 10 seconds every five seconds. You can stop that, you can interrupt it, and you'll see that the captain is very successful at doing that. It's still causing a problem. But it's gonna happen over and over again. You can see a, a series of events that happen over several seconds. When the trouble really fits in is we start to like get directions to switch a different, uh, to. A, I'm sorry, to switch to a different heading. Um, what we see here some time later is that we have MCAS kicking in, trying to send us downward, while control is telling us to avoid traffic. There's a plane in our vicinity, and we need you to turn to 070. The airplane is heading at 023. Everything's messed up uh, at this point. So let's pause for a second. The controller is giving us heading and altitude. We have unreliable airspeed. We can't find the checklist. We're reading a checklist while every five seconds, something is trying to push us down that we have to fix. We're trying to avoid aircraft. We're trying to maintain heading. We're trying to maintain altitude. And the stick is shaking and the thing is screaming at us. That's what's happening. So I went through some of these details about what the MCAS is doing. Uh, sometime later, there's a request for the flight engineer. It just so happens there's a flight engineer on the plane. 14 seconds later, the captain is pointing somewhere in the cabin. You can't see it. It's just a recording. And it says, look what's happening. <laughs> look at this. All right. This becomes interesting at this point. Control says switch to arrival. We're going to land you. Now, here's the problem. You did some setup. You're configured for departure. You, in most cases, all likely, you have frequencies for your trip and potentially for your end destination. What you are not fully prepared for is switching to a frequency back at the place you just came from, unless it's the same frequency you were talking to. In this case, they're asking you to switch frequencies. Somebody's got to have the cognitive awareness, lacking the cognitive load, to be able to memorize that, tell and report that, set it in, and start talking to them. Hey, we're with you, all right? That's all happening while the plane is trying to push down. Now, this is also another important element of flying. The captain asked the FO to take control. We always have a positive exchange of control. We always know who's flying. It actually happens like this. Uh, second in the can, you have the controls. I have the controls, you have the controls. It's a, it's, a, it's a handshake that happens in the plane. We know always who has control of the airplane. 
It was requested that the FO takes over. Notice a couple of things that are very significant here. The captain has been responding to the NCAS and has been uh, interrupting the downward of the nose. But now we have a new person. The captain then takes over communications. One of the things that's most significant, I mentioned it before, is that he reports his aircraft with the wrong call sign. His cognitive load is too high. His workload is too high. He's not thinking at this point. And then, and then control says no restrictions. That's very meaningful. You, you, it's, everything is yours. You do what you have to do. The, the MCAS activates, but now it activates for eight seconds. It's not one second, not three seconds, eight. It's almost the full amount of time that the MCAS wants to execute. But what's also significant is there's a whole other computer in the airplane that tries to mimic what it's like for a pilot to be in a plane if it wasn't controlled by computers. It tries to mimic what it would be in a plane that for which you had uh, no hydraulics, where you had controls that are pulleys, like what my plane has. And so, if you have downward nose, there's a pressure on the yoke. And the way you relieve that pressure, for me, is I trim a little bit, and it trims the pressure out. But they have downward trim, the, compu the computer's forcing it down, he's needing to pull back, he's seated, he's pulling back, and it requires 82 pounds of pulling to break even. Not to pull up, to break even, to stay at the same uh, uh, speed, vertical speed that he's going. So if he's going vertically 500 feet per minute, he's going to maintain vertical down 500 feet per minute if he just pulls 82 pounds. Sometime later, uh, again, you have broken communication, says five thou, captain says, it's okay. This is a fascinating quote at the tail end of this communication, it's okay. We have MCAS kicking in four seconds. Column pressure, 93 pounds. It's increasing. At some point here, we have the captain, uh, uh, oh, we have the display of what altitude we're at is 3,200 feet. We have another display at 3,600. So one of those two might be close to true, but it's reasonably in the same space. And we are at a descent rate of 10,000 feet per minute. At that rate, at that altitude, you have 21 seconds to, get to, to reach ground. Sorry, I paused there once in a while. <laughs> 21 seconds. In all likelihood, there's no way to recover this plane at this point. It's, it's just 10,000 feet per minute. Is almost, there's structural uh, con uh, restraint, uh, constructural limits on the plane, to, and there's so many Gs you can even pull to pull out of this type of speed descent. All right, enough of the report. And I think we know the end result. Um, software causes. Now, almost always, the pilot in command is responsible. And the, in, in almost all reports, there's gonna be some segment of their responsibility. We could try to blame the pilot in control, but now we, we need to talk through a number of things. We need to become a pilot for a second, right? So let's learn to fly. Learning to fly in the US means following this. There's a FAR, which is the Federal Aviation puts out the Federal Aviation Regulation. It also includes the AIM, which is the Aeronautical Information Manual. What is on the FAR is federally regulated. What's in the AIM is kind of suggestions of how things should be interacted with. It's protocols, if you will, but they're not mandated. Um, what I have is a license. It means I have a single engine land uh, that's what I'm rated for. I can fly, technically, I can legally, I can fly any single engine land plane. So if, if it lands in the ocean, can't do it. If it <laughs> you guys are laughing, but there are seaplanes. <laughs> I can't fly that plane. If it has multiple engines, I can't fly that plane. Now what becomes super important in this particular category is that I'm legally capable. What stops me from flying a different type of plane? We need to talk about that, okay? Type of planes, I told you, I've flown a number of Cessnas, 152, 172, 182. Uh, my plane is a, technically, you can see the last entry there is a PA-28R-180. Uh, what that means is a PA, which is a Piper Arrow, 28 uh, R is the model. R is a retractable landing gear, and 180 is 180 horsepower. That's my plane. Uh, 
When we look at the 737, the 737 has had a number of variations. It started out as a 737, 100, and 200. It moved to a classic, which is the 300, 400, and 500. Those were really the workhorse in the industry. They came out with an NG. Of course, everybody has to have a next generation, right? It's not a surprise to software people. <laughs> Uh, and then they came out with the Max, and we need to talk about that. Now, types of planes. We talked about types. What does this mean? It's very specific. It's very meaningful. That's my plane right there. I'm filling up somewhere in Colorado. It means I could fly this plane. It's a single-engine land plane, and it's beautiful. It's like a 12-seater in the right configuration. It's awesome. I can fly my plane. I can, can't get it above 14,000 feet. Uh, it's just, it's got limitations. Uh, and even at that level, I have to have oxygen. This plane, it can go to 24,000 feet. That's fantastic. I can fly over mountains now. That's really great, as opposed to flying around mountains. It makes things more convenient. Why can't I fly that? Legally, I can. The, what stops me is nobody will insure me. The insurance stops me from flying that plane. Nobody will insure me. What do I re what's required for me to fly that plane? I need a checkoff from a flight instructor. A chief flight instructor would take me in this plane. I'd probably fly it for 10 or 20 hours. He'd go, yeah, it looks great. He'll sign me off. Now someone will insure me. That's what's required. That's the difference. Now, it becomes important. We run everything in aviation based on type, type of plane. How many 737s are there? And the question that I want you to pose in your head, how many times and what types of things can I change before the thing is a different thing? It's a meaningful question. I have a quiz for you now. This airplane, is this plane going up or down? Up or down? Up. It's a common thing. I ask this, I work with Boy Scouts, and I ask the same thing. Everybody says the same thing. What you're, what, the illusion is two things. One, it's in the clouds. The second illusion is it's pointed up. Can you really tell whether this plane is going up or down? Have you ever seen a plane, probably not at this attitude, but have you ever seen a plane pointed this way that is going down? When? Every time it's landing, yes. Okay, so the nose, the pitch, is not what causes a plane to go up or down. Lift is what causes a plane to go up and down. What controls lift? We have to, it's wings. One is wing design. Once a plane is designed, I don't have control over that, right? So we build wings with a characteristic that has a certain kind of lift, has a certain amount of, of, of lift it can generate based on what? Airspeed, angle of attack. Those are the other two factors that are super important in this particular case. Notice we also talked about the angle of attack indicator being incorrect on this plane, on the 737, right? So lift, to get lift, I have to have more lift than weight. Uh, you can see the other factors on the plane. But what we want to talk about there really is about the wing. We generate lift by having air flow across the, win uh, the wing, and we need that to also be at a certain angle of attack. Now, as I get a plane that is at a greater and greater angle of attack, at some point the wind is not going across the wing. Is that fair? Everybody get it? At that point, it is a stall, no matter what speed you are going. Now here's the mistake that most junior uh, aviators will make. When you're flying a plane, this, your, your yoke, in particular when you're not flying a jet, if you're flying a prop like I do, this is airspeed. If I push down, it goes faster. If I pull back, it goes slower. If I pull back enough, I will stall. This is throttle. This is, uh, is lift. At the right angle of attack, if I have enough push, people think this is speed. No, it's, it's, it's lift. If I punch more, I will generate lift. This controls airspeed. And the mistake you commonly see is people coming in too low uh, when they're too uh, immature and flying, and they'll pull up because that's the natural tendency. It's I want to go higher. And that's effective for a very short period of time until you stall. The recovery out of a stall is to nose down. Always, I need airspeed. The only way to get lift is to have air go across my wings. I push. You're asking yourself the question, why do we have this thing pushing the nose down? It's a great question. It's to generate airspeed. Now there's a little bit more to the story. We're gonna get to it, all right? So 
If the angle of attack is off, we will generate less lift. We will eventually go into a stall, and we have yoke and power, which I've gone through a little bit of a, a demonstration of. All planes have what we, we call it pushing the envelope, right? Uh, but there's an envelope which defines certain speeds and tolerances and g-forces that are allowed on the plane before you'll cause structural damage. So we have a lot of airspeeds we memorize, generally speaking. We have uh, the, the ones that are super important. VA is maneuvering speed. I can do anything at VA, but uh, if I'm past VA, I might have to do slow down my things. I might be pulling too many g's. VX, super important, best angle of attack. Uh, VY, best uh, rate of, of climb, and that becomes important. If you want to stay, if you lose engines, and you want to stay in the air the longest, you want VY. VY, anything faster than VY will land you sooner. Anything slower than VY will land you sooner. VY is the exact optimal speed for taking the plane as long as it possibly can in the air. So there's a bunch of speeds that we know, and there's a bunch of V speeds. You'll have the slides if you're interested. We got these checklists we go through. I mentioned already a little bit earlier that the recovery mechanism for a stall is to push the nose over. Uh, every two years, I have to go through a biannual, and that is essentially a flight instructor reviewing with me a number of things, but they almost always include emergencies, and that includes stalls. I happen to absolutely love power on stalls. You slow speed stalls are what you're gonna have when you're landing. You're coming in slow, you're in a landing configuration, and everything is sluggish. Everything takes an exaggeration because you have less wind. But when you have a power on stall, you're essentially, you slow it up a little bit, you start to nose it as high as you possibly can, and you punch it, and it's awesome, because you just like fall that way, right? Um, and then you do recovery out of it, and you need enough altitude, right? So, you should join me sometime. <laughs> I'll take you flying. I usually have to test people what kind of person they are uh, to see what kind of flight we're gonna have. So, I can be calm as well, it's true. Now, trim, what is this trim thing? Well, at certain air speeds, you, you want to, you most likely, in many situations, want to just fly level. And at a certain air speed, you would trim for that air speed. And it provides the ability to not touch anything. The, the plane flies itself. It, you don't even need the autopilot for that. For maintaining altitude, I just need to trim for it. Just up or down a little bit, and you're like, okay, it's about right. If you punch a little bit more speed, you might have to trim a little bit more. It also, when you're pulling back and it's really heavy and you're fighting it, you can trim it. You can trim it, and now it's really easy. There's a lot of pressure on the yoke, and you can, you can increase or decrease that based on your trim, which you see me pulling over here. Also, I've been describing the trim on the elevator trim, and what you see on the picture here is an L-run trim, which I don't tend to. But L-run trim is basically bank trim. You're trying to make sure I'm not continually banking. Uh, I, my plane actually doesn't have that, but uh, the, the red that you see well, over here, the red, is the elevator trim, and that maintains your altitude at, the, at that right speed. The other thing that's super important is CG envelope. There's a couple of envelopes we worry about. In this particular case, every time I fly, I should do a weight and balance. I should find out how much you weigh, uh, sometimes challenging to ask, right? Uh, how much baggage do we have, and where is it located? There's a thing called an arm, and the arm is essentially the movement of center of gravity from a predetermined point in the airplane. And you can only have that arm move too much, or so, so far, before you've changed the, the stall characteristics of the plane. If I have it way, way back, the arm's way, way back, what's gonna happen is it's gonna be impossible for me to nose it down which means that I'm gonna go instantly into a stall. And it will change the speed at which a stall will occur. It's super important to manage that. Uh, and then of course I have a max weight. And if I'm reaching close to max weight, I might dump fuel so I can take you, right? <laughs> like that's, I've had some larger passengers like, okay, half tanks, right? So. <laughs> we have a standard six pack. Yeah, it's, it's not here, it's <laughs> six pack. Uh, this is standard. It's almost impossible to get uh, older aviators to look at a different thing. We keep changing the flight uh, display, but everybody's used to this. But what's super important here is that I got one, two, three, four, five, six, a couple of things. Three of those things are air controlled. They're static or ram air that's coming in for airspeed. Th uh, the other three are gyros. Two of the gyros are electric, one of the gyros is vacuum, and there's two vacuums involved. I could, I could kick in an alternate vacuum if I need to. So I have a ton of redundancy even in my plane. Uh, 
But the other thing to note is I can cross-check, and when I'm looking at the instruments highly, I, I've got a pattern going on. Everybody has a different pattern. Mine's more like a figure eight where I'm scanning and understanding. But if I were to lose, and we, we, we go through this constantly for instrument training, they'll take um, essentially a plate, and they will cover one of the instruments, and they'll say, you just lost this. You just lost your DG, which is number five. It's your di uh, directional gyro. Well, your alternate right, is right here, it's your compass, right? It's, it's, we have a solution for that. But the other thing is if I've lost my DG, it's also used for turn indication, am I banking at all? And I can tell my bank based on the turn indicator, I can also tell based on uh, uh, this indication, right? My altitude or attitude indicator. So those become super useful. I can cross check across a number of things and verify that all the instruments are in sync with each other. And it's, it's useful, it's super important. Um, I'm not gonna cover this too much, but this is what you would look at to validate an approach plate. What's important though, is that as you scale across here, you can see ATIS, St. Louis, uh, approach, uh, spirit tower, ground. That is the frequencies that I'm gonna constantly switch through as I approach an, aer uh, an airport. I would tune into ATIS and get the weather. I would instantly call into uh, approach. I would say, I would listen to the weather and it says uh, whiskey, which is always great, right? So then I get to report to control that 3724 Tango's with whiskey, right? <laughs> that means that I have the weather. Um, and uh, then they would switch me to tower as soon as I'm within the, 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 or within the range of, of tower. We can talk about range of a plane, and then, and then we need to switch back to some discussions that are focused on the 737. The range of a plane, basically driven by fuel and fuel burn. So I can hold 50 gallons of fuel, I burn 10 gallons an hour, <laughs> Nor, that's my expectation. I have had the, which means you can fly for five hours, right? Uh, and then I have to calculate winds to see what the true range of the thing is. At zero winds, I have a certain range that's pretty predictable. Uh, and then I have to calculate headwinds or you know, crosswinds or tailwinds. I have had this plane in the air for greater than six hours. How is that possible? <laughs> well, when you reach high altitude, I like to fly when I'm flying long distance around 10,000, 11,000 feet, uh, there is a low density in the air. With low density, you have to trim the fuel. So I'm pulling back fuel because it's too rich. It'll actually cause the engine to fail because it's too rich. So I have to trim it back, but in trimming it back, now I'm burning somewhere around the neighborhood of six to seven gallons an hour, which gives me the ability to go in a longer duration. I know, you're like, how do you use, how do you not go to the bathroom in six hours? It happens all the time. I, this is where I can't take passengers, right? But <laughs> here's a bottle. <laughs> all right, there's some rules in aviation that become super important. The rules are up here. Uh, aviate, navigate, communicate. They happen in exactly that order. Super useful to have your own priorities within your organization. If you cannot keep the plane in the air, it doesn't matter where you're going. Aviate comes first. Once you can maintain self, uh, safe al altitude, now you need to make sure that you are navigating to an appropriate place, something safe, potentially. It is only after you know that you're in the air and you are moving to a safe place that you would ever communicate. They happen, you would never communicate first. Uh, with the one potential exception, depending on your situation, you might communicate an emergency if you are unable to do the other two, right? right. But in general, it's exactly always that order. We talked about the positive uh, exchange of control. The other things that you need to know to be a pilot, I'm not gonna go heavy into this, is airspace. Uh, and it gets somewhat complex. I can tell you this, that anytime you're flying into a major airport, which of course Lion would be, you're in a Class Bravo, Class B airspace. Class Bravo airspace is very restrictive, and there are speed limits, uh, and th there's lots of things that you have to worry about um, when you're in that space. They did not have this concern at that particular time. Let's talk about gauges for a second. When we're looking at gauges, there's been this interest for some time, maybe 20 or 30 years ago, there was a big kick in it, to move from analog gauges to digital gauges. And the beauty is, of course, is that I can have accuracy. But nobody cares about accuracy. Uh, I used to be, uh, you care at some level, right? But that's not the crucial point when you are driving. When I'm driving, I'm not looking, do I have one gallon of gas or one liter of gas? I, I don't really care. What I care is the needles on E. Right? I can look at it and instantly know without cognitively putting a workload on my mind. I don't have to read and understand and interpret. I can instantly see. Uh, I started out my career 
as a, in the United States Navy as a nuclear reactor operator. So that's what I did. They tried to switch out uh, our reactor control panel from analog needles, essentially, to digital. It was a total fail. They basically had to switch them all back. Uh, because you can look at a panel, and there's a lot of things to worry about. You got primary coolant, you got secondary coolant, you got pumps, you got, all kind, you got electrical loads, you got all kinds of things you care about, and all you care is that it's in the green. You, at some point, you may want to be exact. At some point, you might want to record it. But when you are looking to react to something, you see the needle deflect, and you're like, oh, wow, wait a minute. That's a problem. Let's figure this out. Okay, so something to be aware of when you're building maybe UIs, uh, building controls for humans. We know that humans need feedback. If you look at my watch, it has heptic feedback. It will, it'll kind of give me a little buzz. It'll tell me certain things. Humans are terrible if I had a keyboard and it doesn't give me the right feel. You guys know somebody that has to have the exact right keyboard for them to work? Right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, you guys. Okay. <laughs> Everybody that laughed. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a feedback. And if, if you touch it and you don't feel it go down, you don't hear it click, if you don't have the, the, the feedback that you're used to, something's off. And you know it. It's, it's awkward. It's uncomfortable. Right? And so that's the thing to worry about and be concerned with. Now, here's another point, though, and it's super important. When you're building in feedback, what's super important is that you understand the context of things the context of things. What else is going on? If I have 200 other errors going on, well, let's pause for a second. If you're looking at your CI environment and you have 200 things that are red and you have one more thing that happens, do you do anything about it? <laughs> no, like that, you're, you know, right? It's, 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 it gets lost in the noise. So you have to build a system that you have to be aware of making sure if a system, if software, if computers are helping a human, that you know the context the human's in and direct them to the prime directive, the most important thing. And then they can move on to the other things. It's so hard when there's so much noise. And in particular, when you're dealing with something like aviation, you have to solve it. Now, I want you to think and pause for a second. We are within years, I don't know how many, but within years, going to have automated trucks completely autonomous. We're going to have, we, frankly, we have them today in certain places in the U.S. Uh, in Vegas, when I was there, I actually op opted in to uh, a totally autonomous taxi for Lyft. I'm like, yeah, do it. <laughs> it didn't happen, unfortunately. But we have them happening today, and that's software. Software is driving that, right? It's, it's, a, it's a significant uh, point. All right. So I talked a lot about workload. One of my favorite quotes is from my flight instructor is, flying is hours of boredom followed by 10 minutes of total terror. <laughs> and that's aviation, right? You're like, ah, oh, what do we do? You're flight, you know, you're, you're on uh, autopilot, and then all of a sudden you have to land the thing, right? <laughs> all right. So when we look at automation, uh, we want to look at the types, of co the types of automation. We have control, we have warnings and alerts, and we have information. And the challenge that you have is this. This is, a, I feel, a super important subject. Uh, if you have excess workload, it slows down the task and it creates errors for humans. Humans act and behave this way. If there's too much workload, there will be errors. There will be challenges and failures. If there is too little workload, there'll be boredom and, uh, and a reduction of alertness. This is just human behavior at this point. So we have to find that balance where we are engaging the pilot or whatever we are automating. Uh, and we are directing them with the right workload. All right, I'm going to bypass some of this. But if we look at the, 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 the workload on a pilot over time, you can see that, uh, again, boredom followed by total terror, right? That's, <laughs> that's, the, that's the slope. Now, let's look at the economics of aviation. First of all, uh, there's an interesting report uh, that came out in 2008, I believe, where fuel cost uh, we're we're in on, the, on the rise by 23.4%. That's a lot of increase, right? So fuel costs drive a lot of aviation. And by fuel cost, uh, depending on what you're trying to do, you can actually carry more payload or you can uh, save money on the plane, right? I can reduce the amount of fuel that it's using based on the payload or I could use the same amount of fuel and get more across. That's the core of it. We have, t I hate to be so um, 
uh, my op uh, you know, to reduce it to this amount of simplicity, but we had two major pieces of, of airplanes in, in commercial aviation. One is a narrow body and the other is a wide body. When you look at the narrow bodies, what was happening is they were commonly used regionally. So they would fly from St. Louis to Chicago. They would fly from uh, Stockholm to Hamburg, right? That, that's the kind of thing they would do. And when they got there, they would land and they would load and unload. They were on the ground a lot. And when you're on the ground a lot, yeah, fuel efficiency isn't your game plan. It's not the thing that's gonna make you a bunch of money. What's gonna make you well, lots of money is getting the plane in the air, right? When we have the wide bodies, they're going across the ocean. And those are in the, plane, uh, in the air for significantly longer time. We need more efficient engines. But we had a couple things happening. So this was the model that we had. We had this average of, of things going on. We had some challenges with gas prices that was going on, and we had to solve that. And the way we ended up solving that is we said, you know what, if I could make this narrow body plane more efficient, I could use it for the longer flights. We weren't filling the wide bodies. I wasn't getting enough people in there, but I didn't have enough range to be able to get further on the narrow bodies. So all the factors that were uh, part of the decision making early on caused a problem later on. They're like, look, we need you to build more efficient engines so that we can go further with smaller planes. The other part of the economics of aviation is that I need to schedule aircraft and crew. I need to figure out who's going to fly what. Now, I told you already, uh, most of these, all these pilots are going to be multi-engine land flying pilots. But they're also going to be certified, uh, insurable on specific uh, types of aircraft. Now, if I have a, two pilots that fly Boeing uh, 320s and I have the rest of my pilots flying 737s, I might have a problem because the guy who flies the, the, the Airbus, he might also fly a 737. I'm left with in this, this dilemma of do I f load him on a 737 or do I get him on a flight on the, on the Airbus and I have to get this Airbus off, I have to reserve them. There's a lot of complexity to this. So that's what we're trying to solve in this particular case. So uh, before scheduling, pilot must be qualified. Uh, you had to have been uh, uh, basically certified within that type. You had to have been trained in that type. There's a lot of uh, aspects of that. Now, if you were going to come out with a new aircraft, the problem with that is no pilots are certified to fly it, none of them. So when you come out with a brand new aircraft, I have to wait a period of time after the plane lands to get flight instructors to fly with pilots. Now they're not flying commercially. Uh, they're paying them to fly for fun until they get to the point where the, they can be certified. And now I can schedule them. And now I have one. <laughs> and I might need more than that, right? So you have a larger class and you have some problems in that space. When you look at uh, uh, another aspect is the regional or the cheap airlines, Ryanair, Southwest, Frontier, uh, they, if you notice, have all the same aircraft. They can schedule all of their pilots on all of their craft because they're all the same type. And in this particular category, 737s dominate. They are the workhorse in aviation. So what could we do? Well, what if we made a 737 with more efficiency? It could fly further and we already have a crazy number of pilots that can fly it. They're already in type, they're already certified. The scheduling problem goes away. The training problem goes away. It's cheap. Here's another interesting dynamic. We call it politics. <laughs> right? American decides to announce in June 20th, 2011, that they're going to buy Airbuses. This is the first time ever that American Airlines is going to buy an Airbus. Uh, they, uh, Boeing, had them locked in to their product and their product alone. And now they're going outside and it's scary. But there's something else that's super important from a political standpoint, and that's this. Boeing is also gonna order 100 Boeing expected, important word, evolution of the 737NG with a new engine that offers even more significant fuel efficiency. What is important about this particular article is that Boeing had never announced that they were gonna do this. Boeing strong-armed, I'm sorry, American Airlines strong-armed Boeing into doing what they wanted. We want a 737 that is more efficient and you're going to deliver it. Or we're going to go to Airbus 
and we're going to cancel what we currently have with you. All right, that's what happened. One month after Boeing, I'm sorry, after, uh, I'm saying the same thing over again, right? One month after American Airlines announced that they were going to get 100 expected new planes, which hadn't even named yet, one month after, Boeing comes out and says, yeah, we're going to build one. We're going to build it. We're going to build this thing called the 737 MAX. All right? It's fascinating. By the way, most of these things, I have links where you can get deeper details if you're so inclined and interested. But you can see the dynamics that is happening. Let's talk about the 737, the evolution. What's interesting about the 737? Well, first of all, it was born in 1964. It was envisioned in 1964. Anybody here born then? <laughs> yeah. Me neither. <laughs> All right. It was envisioned in 1964. It actually came to fruition in uh, uh, 1967, uh, where they delivered the first one to Lufthansa. How great is that? Uh, we had the 100 and the 200. What's interesting also, also super valuable to the conversation, is at this time, it was designed low to the ground. So here's a narrow body plane that's small and has whatever fuel efficiency it has, right? But the engines, by design, are low to the ground, giving us two features, design features. One, if you fly into a small airport that doesn't have your big airport features, you can work on an engine because it's right there in front of you. You don't need a lift. If you need to get the luggage, you can just pull it out. It's right there at the, it's low to the ground. I don't need to get any special equipment. It was a feature. <laughs> Shortly after that, we came with the 737 Classic. It began in 1979. We have more people that were probably born within that space. Uh, we have the 300, the 400, 500. Those different uh, 300, 400, 500 are just different configurations, different you know, seating, just different configurations. Um, we had the NG that came out in 1993. We had the 600, 700, 800, 900. And then finally, in uh, at least 2011, we announced the MAX. Now, when we look at engines and we look for efficiency, we can fall back on our physics. Now, without going through the details of physics and the, the second law of thermodynamics, which is required to understand this, the simple way to understand this is the bigger the engine, the hotter the engine, the more efficient the engine. That's, that's the basics of what you see here, okay? The bigger you can make it, the hotter it is, the more efficient it would be. So if we took at the evolution of the engine, the, set, the original, the 100s and 200s, had what they referred to as the cigar engine, small, right? When we got to the NGs, we started having kind of, you can see kind of this, this bow here, right? We went all of one, uh, oval. Why? We needed a bigger engine, we needed more efficiency, but it was gonna hit the ground, so we're gonna, they call this the hamster mouth, right? The hamster mouth. And then we got to the max. What's up with the max? Well, the engine has to be bigger, and it doesn't fit. It's gonna drag on the ground or worse. Uh, and two things happen. One is, we have to push the engine forward. So now the weight, the arm, or the CG of the plane is completely changed. We're moving it forward. By moving it forward, the, the engine tapers off and we can then kind of push up the engine. It's up higher. Now, uh, we also require eight inches on the nose gear. So we've increased the nose gear and we move the engine forward. And in January 2019, the highest demand Boeing's ever seen with, with confirmed orders for the 730 MAX was 5,000. A little scary, <laughs> right? All right. Let's talk about aviation airworthiness. So we have a challenge, and that is uh, over time in the, in the US, uh, there's been organizations been asked to tighten the belt. So uh, the FAA kept asking for more resources, and they're like, you're gonna have to make do with what you have. And to give like a really strong analogy, it's like having engineers that make $30,000 a year overseeing uh, companies that have engineers making 200,000 a year, right? That, that's a ridiculous thing to have happen. Bad things will happen. So uh, there's some thought that went into this. Uh, Congress then, uh, after asking them to tighten their belt, they solved this problem by introducing or enacting a new thing called the ODA. I'm gonna look at that in a second. Now, what you also see on this slide is a book by Ralph Nader. He's a US uh, congressional representative. He's most famous in the US 
uh, for enacting safety rules associated with automobiles. He, if you have seatbelts on, it's largely because he championed that. What's interesting here is he wrote a book in the 90s, you see it up here, uh, how aviation is gonna have a problem. This book was written in 1994. The sad thing about this is that Ralph Nader <coughs> lost his grandniece on Ethiopian Airlines. It's a big deal. He knew it was coming. And he had a personal loss in it, right? Back to FAA. Since the FAA doesn't have the resources, what we are gonna do is we're gonna enact this thing called the Delegated Organizations uh, Authorization. And what that means is instead of the FAA certifying planes, the organization will designate somebody within their company, Boeing will designate someone in their company to certify the plane at safety and report back. Should work, right? <laughs> That's just crazy talk. That's crazy talk. All right. Back to the NTSB, uh, the National Transportation Safety Board. 90% uh, of the time, the PIC, which is the pilot in command, played some factor in the failure of the aircraft. And again, there's a, a reference there. So the question now is how does a hardware problem become a software solution, or vice versa, right? We have this thing, we have this nose, and there's a problem. The problem of this is the lift dynamics have changed. The lift, the CG, the engine, the center line of thrust is different on the wing. So there's a center line, there's air flow coming across it, and it's coming across at a different location on the wing than it ever has on a 737. The CG is completely up front, it's, it's way front, uh, which means, uh, it, this sounds funny because the weight is all forward, but the engine is so powerful, it's so efficient, that when they punch it, when they hit thrust, it does this. <laughs> so, what happens if you do this in a plane? Stall. You stall. So that's an important feature, that, not feature, that's an important thing to know, right? Uh, is that we're gonna go into a stall. It's caused by all the factors that we just put out. What is the solution for this? Boeing decided to come out with something called the Maneuvering Characteristics Augmentation System. <laughs> We're gonna augment things. Now, the keys here, and you saw this when we read the report. The angle of attack is too high. The autopilot is off. Had they turned on the autopilot, this wouldn't have happened. The problem is, is you never turn on the autopilot until you're at flight level, right? Um, you climb to flight level, you, you switch on autopilot. Two, the flaps are up. Remember when they were having some problems and they threw in flaps? Then they wouldn't have problems. And they took flaps back out. Flaps, flaps on a plane extend the wing. They change the wing characteristic. Typically, on my plane, what happens is the flaps come out. They usually come out in 10, 20, and 30 degrees. It changes the shape of the wing and it allows me to have lift at slower speeds. If I land with flaps in, I have to land hot. I have to land very fast. If I put the flaps out, I can land slower. So the, small, the stall speed changes, and that's, that's generally the reason why we have these flaps. Okay. Uh, and then notice also a, steep, a, a super steep turn will also uh, uh, turn off this particular feature. Deactivation. Uh, it deactivates when the angle of attack is sufficiently lowered. In other words, we put the nose down, or when the pilot overrides. Should be no problem, right? Pilot's just gonna override it. Now, here's some challenges, which are also super important. The MCAS. The POH to a pilot is the gospel, it's the Bible. It has everything a pilot should know. They read it backward and forward. It is where the checklists are. It is where the characteristics are. It is where the, the, the V speeds are determined and, and, and discussed. It, is, it tells you when the density altitude of the air is at a certain level, here's the differences in the plane. Here's how long the plane requires to land and roll out if you are going this speed, if you're landing this plane at this altitude. All of that stuff is in the POH. Guess what is not in the POH? MCAS, it doesn't exist. How is a pilot in command responsible for something he knows nothing about? When we have a positive exchange of control, you have the plane, I have the plane, I've turned on the autopilot, 
Who is in control when MCAS kicks in? When a ghost in the plane takes control, who's responsible? That's what we're having. That's the challenge we have, right? Why is it not there? It was expected that if they changed the POH, that it would require additional training and potentially have the threat of reclassifying the type of this airplane, which would destroy the economics that we talked about. All right, that's, that's the reason. So, it was assumed that if things went awry, that it would look like what we refer to as a runaway trim. If there was a runaway trim, there is a checklist for that. If you follow that checklist, it was assumed things would be okay. There's more to that story. All right, so I had this question. I should have waited for this slide. Who's in control, right? <laughs> We're counting on you. <laughs> All right, so Boeing's telling FAA and pilots, hey, there, there, this plane is a 737. You need nothing more than a 30-minute video, and that's what they sent out. Here's a 30-minute video, and you're fully ready to fly a 737 if you're a, 30, a 737 pilot. That's it. Guess what is not in the video? MCAS, it doesn't exist, doesn't exist. It's a hidden feature. All right, so assuming low speed stalls, you're probably at low altitude because you're coming in for a landing, and, uh, and, and you also assume greater air density because as you climb, you have lower air density. Uh, you have to be aggressive. That was why it was determined uh, that we needed 10 seconds on and five seconds off for this MCAS to kick in in order to rotate 2.5 degrees. That was, it was a design feature. We also have this thing called the elevator feel computer. The elevator feel computer is the thing that makes you feel what is happening with the airplane. There is a computer that knows that the plane is nose down, so it makes the yoke harder to pull. This is designed into the system. It didn't have to be. You could have made it light as a feather. You, you didn't have to pull 100 pounds to save the plane. But we decided, somebody decided, that that would be a better feel. At some point, somebody should have thought, potentially, that there's a limit to that, right? But that's not the case. Let's go one level deeper. There's a thing in the 737, when you look at the epinage, that's the tail end of the plane. The whole epinage is the whole thing. You have the elevator here, you got the uh, horizontal stabilizer there, the vertical stabilizer involved. But right here you have a jack screw. And what happens when this, this goes up, the nose goes down. This elevator goes up and hits this jack screw. Notice a couple of things. This is up hitting the jack screw. This is trimmed. This is set for a downward nose. This flap or trim is set for an upward nose. We call that a mist trim. And if you notice, the plane through MCAS is being trimmed down and the pilot is trying to pull up. It's exactly the situation we have. And it's a, it's a situation we call a mist trim. When you're in a mist trim, it is harder to pull back and it is harder also to correct. To get the trim out is hard. In fact, years ago, and I found this, decided to add it to the slides, it's been taken out and does not exist in the system today. The recommended mechanism for solving this is what they called the roller coaster. <laughs> How do you like that as a commercial uh, passenger, right? The solution is simple, it looks like this. You've ever gone deep sea fishing or seen it? You go out there, you go out, uh, you're throwing out the line, you're deep sea fishing, you got a big, you got, the, you got the boat going, and you got a big monster on the back line. You, you can't just reel this thing, what do you do? Pull back hard and reel it down. Pull back hard and reel it down. That's the suggestion. Push the nose down and trim it out. Pull it back up. Push the nose down, trim it back out. Because it's too hard to do it unless you relieve the pressure because of the jack screw. So that was how we fix this situation. <laughs> the other solution would be to flip the switch <laughs> for the particular MCAS or runaway trim. Again, three solutions. Switch to autopilot, not gonna happen unless you're at uh, altitude. Flaps, put in flaps, fine. Or kill the trim switch. For whatever reason, that did not happen. 
Let's talk quickly about the angle of attack or the uh, attitude sensor that I was referring to. Here is the greatest downfall of MCAS. Now, I asked you earlier who's a pilot. I got no hands, so I assume nobody's a pilot. Here's the interesting thought. Who in here would turn down a contract to write software for avi uh, aviation? So it's an interesting thought, right? Like, how much would you need to know? How much context do you need to have in order to write successfully? The MCAS system was tied into one angle of attack indicator. What do pilots use? They use two. They're looking at, uh, we have a disagreement. They talk to each other. Hey, I have a disagreement here. I have software that's looking at one. We talked about this already, about the frequency of things. Let's talk about uh, a couple of other Boeing things. One, the, the uh, attitude indicator, the angle of attack indicator. The message should have popped up on the screen, on the flight display. It didn't, why? Well, the software was generated by subcontractors, for one. <laughs> for some reason that becomes important. In order to get this feature, you have to pay for it. Lion Air opted out of paying extra for it. It was discovered that this could be a problem. And then Boeing says, well, you'll get it on the next scheduled update. Software, right? You just, just update it. Involved with the software development are essentially recent college grads. You can read the text there, but the, the core of it is we have a, a, essentially, it took many rounds going back and forth because the code was not done correctly. So they kept like sending it back and sending it back and sending it back. On top of that, we had pressures from managers to limit the changes that we might introduce extra cost or time. They were limited because we became very expensive, so we started hiring cheaper people. And one of my favorites is an engineer that said in an all hands meeting, it was reported by management that we did not need senior engineers because our products are mature. <laughs> all right, that's fantastic. Scary. All right. The challenge. The challenge is that Lion went down first. Lion Air. Uh, Indonesia has a, a poor aviation history. Because they have a poor aviation history, when it went down, even though there's clearly all kinds of things in this report that point to more than their problem, clearly, uh, it was seen mostly by the industry as, well, it's their problem. They, they, they already suck, right? Uh, they're already uh, terrible. It must be, it must be. And frankly, you could also say, well, it kind of was. They put an attitude uh, or angle of attack indicator out of uh, sync by 20, 21 degrees. Yeah, that happened. Um, and so the problem is that this hid the real problem, that we have um, non-air um, checking software uh, and that we have the potential of having another problem. So we didn't even go far with this. And that was the report. Now, looking at the report, again, I'm going to draw out a couple of things. I don't know how much time we'll have to go through all of this, but uh, we'll give it a shot. The first conclusion was it was MCAS, software. Number seven was they did not consistently trim out the resulting column forces. They're blaming the pilots and potentially maybe in the switch from the captain to the first officer. He, uh, he definitely was challenged. Number nine, the community, uh, communi uh, I can't even say the word, uh, the increasing mistrim uh, could not be counteracted. Access uh, as, as be, oh, this is my, one of my favorites, number 15. Boeing looked at the loss of one uh, attitude indicator uh, as, and the other being lost, and one being erroneous, as beyond extremely improbable. <laughs> the assumption was this could never happen. Yeah? Assumptions, what do we know? No, <laughs> won't go there. All right, so uh, a number of other things on there that might be worth looking at. Conclusions, the aircraft should have been included, uh, the, the air message. It would have indicated immediately on departure that there's no way we should fly this plane. That was number 31. 
Contributing factors, number one, during the design and certification, assumptions were made that just turned out to be wrong. Number eight, lack of documentation. Nothing on software, in fact, which is interesting. And it was also determined that the flight crew workload was just too high. All they had to do was say, pan, pan, mayday, mayday, and they would have had, they would have had the sky to themselves, essentially. And who knows if that would have saved them, but it would have certainly reduced the workload, and that would have been more likely. So, so some lessons and we'll, we'll end it. To get here, and I appreciate being invited. I've had a really great time and I'd love feedback on this, by the way, because this is, this is new to me. This, uh, I talk software usually. <laughs> uh, but I had software that woke me up. I had software that navigated me to the closest, uh, the closest way, or the quickest way, using Waze, to get to the airport. Software scheduled the, the air crew on my plane. It maintained the altitude and uh, direction of the plane. Uh, software is uh, what I use to send me uh, uh, something to pick me up. It's where I bought train, train tickets right on my phone with, through software. I had software to do this presentation. I had software via GPS all the time for all kinds of things. Interesting thought, I don't know if I have a slide on this, but an interesting thought, as we move into autonomous, so things that are driven by software, one thought here. I know of some pretty good literature that actually is several years old of universities that were testing out GPS and its um, failure mechanisms, essentially. And they were able, in one case, they were able to redirect a cruise liner to a completely different place than what the crew had intended. And what we have is vulnerabilities all over the place and a lack of security for something that's in space, right? So uh, there's a number of things that we need to be thinking about. You know, uh, we're writing software and it matters. All right, uh, I love this so much I pulled it out and it's very rare that I read a full thing but I'm gonna do this one, all right? I'm a software developer turned network engineer and have written airliner aviation software in the past. It is interesting how many hoops we had to jump through to get an onboard computer uh, on, uh, on board, I'll add on board for the computer certified. Took forever to get it added to the plane. While software certifications required nil. This was admittedly nearly 10 years ago and I hope things have changed. I've actually written software to fly in planes as well, oddly enough. I used to write software for GoGo -Go, and if you've ever flown in Singapore Airlines, the very first uh, uh, the first autonomous uh, entertainment system that they ever had was written by me. <laughs> uh, if you watch videos across an oceanic flight, which is something they previously didn't support, I wrote it. And it doesn't take much to put software in a plane. Uh, it just doesn't. So, lessons. Countries trusted the U.S. federal aviation. The federal aviation trusted Boeing and the ODA. Americans trusted their government, among other people, of course. Boeing did what they believed was in their best interest, and Boeing outsourced their interest, right? So, some things that might generally be applied more to software. Assumptions, double, double, triple check your assumptions. You have to have a subject matter expert. You wanna be as close to the problem as possible. You wanna understand the people that work within the system that you are trying to aid. You should expect that a failure in the system is expected. And any time in a system where you have uh, uh, conne uh, hard, connected systems, a failure in one naturally causes a failure in another and we should expect that. We should fail safe is better than fail proof. You need to fail to a safe situation. Uh, I have a, uh, there was a report I read of a gentleman who owns a 730, I'm sorry, he owns a Cessna 172, and he put in a similar system that we have in the 737. There's some automated systems to actually land the plane kind of thing. If there are conflicting reports to the computer, it basically gives up and it says I need a human. It's a good fallback. It's a good fallback. He doesn't have to fight it, right? It's a really big deal. Our goal and writing software should be to be reducing the workload. It should not be increasing the workload, which means being contextually aware 
of what workload there currently is. What stage of the flight are we in? What else is going on in the system? How can I best aid a human in doing the right thing? I would add a couple other things. It's useful, I have found, that there are some things that are assumed. You assume certain scale or non-functional requirements. You assume security. I would, I would uh, advocate that we create, in addition to use cases, abuse cases. How can this feature be abused? I would also advocate safety cases. How can this fail and what happens on failure? And just assume uh, that, that you can't just assume that safety is a part of it. it. And this also depends on the context of the problem you're trying to solve clearly. We want to be able to balance reality and make life easier, right? But the most important thing I would say in this regard is the human has to be able to opt in or opt out. Make a choice on that, but there has to be a way for the human to say, no, it's me, right? I would also say, know when a request that is coming in is politics. I know that's hard. I've been a part of it. I understand it. I get it. When you have somebody who spent $3 billion on some software and they want to look impressive and they want you to build on top of that because now I can justify it. I get it. And it's hard to say no because frankly we're software engineers. I can make anything work. It's just not the right thing. And you have to be aware of that and play within that game to a certain extent. I also say documentation is absolutely required. It, it is more necessary than we give it credit. It's super important, in particular, working in healthcare, working in financial systems, working on aviation. We could go through a list of things. Automated cars. Documentation is crucial. And we need training. No training equals no awareness. Um, I'll kind of slowly add, uh, land on um, cheap is expensive. Cheap is super, super expensive. The, the US Navy SEALs have a phrase that I absolutely love. I think it's something I live by to a certain extent. And it is, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. The fastest way to get out of this building if we had an emergency is to be organized. Total chaos is not the fastest way. All right. And with that, Tucson talk. <laughs> Fly safe. Thank you very much. And that's a wrap. We will be back one year from now. It will be 8th to 10th of February 2021. May the source be with you. <laughs>